Good evening to all of you. My name is Rajkumar. I'm the founding vice chancellor of OP Jindal Global University and dean of Jindal Global Law School, JGU and JGLS in partnership with the Law School Admission Council in the United States is hosting this global legal education colloquium on the theme, why study law, how to select the best students into the law school, and of course, taking LSAT India to pursue a global law school experience. Let me begin by introducing the theme of today's webinar. Lawyers have shaped the foundations of democracy, rule of law, and access to justice in India, in the United States, and indeed around the world. Being a lawyer gives one the privilege to promote the common good and bringing justice to life. However, law is only as good as the complexity of the human behavior. Therefore, studying law is very important to break down these complexities with critical thinking, but also to evolve into responsible, compassionate, and ethical leaders. Even in the current pandemic, beyond the human cost, the injustice created is one of the largest collateral damages. With some countries declaring legal systems and access to justice as essential services, lawyers have become all the more important. Given this increase in the relevance of law and lawyers, it is all the more critical for law schools to ensure academic continuity and also evolve their selection processes to attract students with stronger legal aptitude. Entrance examinations are the very start of a law school journey, and the Law School Admission Council in the United States has played a pivotal role in ensuring that we, are, we enable students to begin their legal journeys. LSAT India has become India's first and only law entrance examination to be entirely online, artificial intelligence enabled, remote proctored examination. It has not only identified means to ensure transparency, accessibility, efficiency, integrity, and safety in the process, but also brought back to the surface a very important question in relation to the centralization of law schools. Being a lawyer entails broad perspectives, local and global and LSAT India provides that opportunity. Therefore, today's colloquium is a very important forum to discuss the importance of studying law, the need for evolution, the selection process of law schools, and the role of LSAT India to redefine the future of law schools and legal education in India. I'm very delighted to welcome a very distinguished group of individuals who have been advancing the cause of institution building in the United States for a very long time. Professor Christine T. Alvare is the Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at the University of California Berkeley School of Law. Ms. Alvare graduated with high honors from the UC Berkeley, earning her BA in Rhetoric and Native American Studies, and went on to earn her JD from Stanford University Law School. Ms. Alvare recently concluded two years of service as Chair of the Law School Admission Council Services and Programs Committee and member of the LAC, LSAC Board of Trustees. Welcome, uh, Professor Alvare. Professor Megan Carpenter is the Dean of the University of New Hampshire School of Law. Dean Carpenter is an international known expert in intellectual property with particular interest in entrepreneurship, branding, and the arts. She has received a JD from the West Virginia University. She has received multiple awards, Texas and AM University System Distinguished Faculty Award, the President's Grand Challenge Award, the Judith Kuhn and Stephen R. Alton Service Award, and the United States Association for Small Business and Entrepreneurship Best Workshop Award. Welcome, Professor Carpenter. Uh, Dr. Jason Nick Dickinson is the director of India Testing at the Law School Admission Council. He writes and reviews questions for LSAT and has managed the creation and administration of the LSAT India since 2014. Dr. Dickinson joined the Law School Admission Council in 2008 after teaching philosophy for six years at the University of Pittsburgh and Washington Jefferson College, both in the state of Pennsylvania. He received his bachelor's degree in philosophy and religious studies from the University of Arizona and the master's and PhD degree in philosophy from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2000 three, where his research focus was on metaphysics. Professor Kelly Testi is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Law School Admission Council, the leading assessment data and technology hub for law schools and their candidates in the United States, Canada, India, and other parts of the world. Testi came to LSAC from the University of Washington School of Law, where she served for eight years as the school's dean, making her the 14th person and first woman to do so. Testi was named the nation's second most influential leader in legal education by national jurists in 2017. Dr. Testi is a first generation college student who earned both an undergraduate degree in journalism and a law degree from Indiana University in Bloomington, which is also her hometown. Professor Kevin Washburn is the N. William Hinz Dean and Professor of Law at the University of Iowa. He's also the chair of the Law School Admission Council Board of Trustees. He earned a BA degree from the University of Oklahoma and a JD from the Yale Law School. Prior to entering academia, he clerked for a judge 
on the Ninth Circuit, worked as a trial attorney and then a prosecutor with the U.S. Department of Justice and served as the National Counsel of the National Indian Gaming Commission. With that introduction, let me begin this discussion today. Let me start with uh, Dr. Carpenter. Uh, Dr. Carpenter, this crisis which we are facing today, the global pandemic crisis, has created new challenges. Even with a drop in certain type of crimes due to social distancing, there is a visible surge in problem areas in law, such as commercial disputes, cyber crimes, data privacy, financial frauds, healthcare access, unemployment, domestic violence, you name it. How do you think COVID-19 will impact the legal profession in the future? Given the anticipated rise in demand for justice, will legal education become more important? That is such a good question. And, you know, we're all, this is a time that is, is so unprecedented that we're all really sick of hearing the word unprecedented. But one of the things that is, is true about the times we live in right now, and it is, time, it is true in, during any time of, of, of chaos and disruption, is that we realize yet again, um, as we have for hundreds of years, that, that our system, that the existence of a civil society really depends on lawyers. When there's chaos, when there are vulnerable populations, lawyers are essential for the grand challenges that, that we face. And whether, you know, throughout history, whether the, and there are issues of civil rights or, or health law and policy or how we define kind of private rights and public needs, um, develop vital technologies as we go forward, all of these kinds of big arguments are really about who we are as, as a people. And around the world, those legal systems are more interconnected than ever. And, and as we think about the kind of society we want to live in, lawyers are, are essential to help find solutions to some of these problems that, that we face. And we've certainly seen that here with regard to um, COVID-19, whether there are solutions involving climate change or, or peace and security or supporting vaccine development um, on the front lines of the World Health Organization, thinking about online learning technologies and things that we are engaging in right now, um, helping to make healthcare policy or reconfiguring manufacturing facilities. Um, you know, there are so many legal questions and lawyers are, are um, essential as, as a tool to, to help find solutions. So I would say that we need, we need more lawyers than ever, um, and we need excellent lawyers that are filled with passion to help solve some of these grand challenges. Thank you very much, um, Dean Carpenter, for that uh, response. Uh, let me move to uh, Kevin. Uh, Kevin, uh, one of the things that today we are you know, looking at is that you know, today students seek legal education, not necessarily to pursue a career in law, but to use legal thinking and aptitude, possibly to be useful in other jobs. Interdisciplinarity and diverse dual and joint law degrees can enable students to pursue legal education in diversify their career trajectories in a shorter duration, something that didn't exist, let's say, when you, know, you and I went to law school. Could this help open law school doors to more diverse and capable students? What are your views on the Juris Doctor degree format in American law schools and expanding their scope to have such a combined offering? Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Absolutely. Um, here in the U.S., lawyers are relied on for a variety of things. As, as Dean Carpenter recognized, you know, lawyers are problem solvers, and the world needs problem solvers more now than ever. And um, that's one of our great strengths. That's what we learn in law school is how to solve sticky, difficult problems. And the um, you know, the fact is that more than half of the presidents of the United States have been lawyers um, in, in, in our history. Um, more than half of the current sitting United States senators are lawyers. And I don't need to talk about this in India where, you know, Mahatma Gandhi is a lawyer that we all have, you know, venerated for decades and, and been an inspiration to the entire world, you know, beyond any country's um, borders. So the world turns to lawyers um, when it needs to solve problems. And it's not just problems in law. Here in the United States, I, I dare say that, that one of the heroes of the last two months is a, is a person named Jay Powell, Jerome Powell. He's actually the chairman of the board of the Federal Board of Governors of um, 
Federal Reserve. So he's a, he's in an economic field, but he was trained in the law. So the, you know the world needed someone to fix the American economy during a time of a pandemic. Did they turn to an economist? No, they turned to a lawyer. So and that's we find that over and over. Now here in the state where I live, I live in the state of Iowa, and um, the uh, person who was the governor here, who had been a trial lawyer, was selected by by President Obama to be the Secretary of Agriculture. Did President Obama select a farmer to be the Secretary of Agriculture? No, he selected a lawyer. And you just find this over and over because it's not because that the people with, you know, that have expertise in a given field are not smart. It's that lawyers are really good at becoming experts and solving problems. Um, that's what we do. We learn to become an expert in, an, in, in a narrow thing, sometimes for a case, sometimes for a business transaction. But we become an expert in that, and um, that's what we're trained to do. We're trained to think of all the difficult problems um, that need to be solved. So it's um, it, it's now more than ever, lawyers are working across fields, uh, not just in the law, but in other areas too. And that's exceedingly important in our in our economy and our world. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, very valuable set of comments. Uh, for all the viewers, we are live on YouTube, and I. Uh, suggest that you send in your questions as we continue this discussion and we'll be taking all your questions or as many questions we can uh, when we begin this when we come conclude this part of the discussion uh, all right let me move to christine uh, christine an important aspect of the law school experience is the diversity of candidates especially international students how will the international student admission and intake be affected in law schools in usa i mean clearly it is going to be affected we've all learned about that and around the world due to this current crisis. Uh, now, can virtual classrooms enable opening up of the otherwise closed borders uh, to promote internationalization in the law schools? Uh, are we looking at internationalization without mobility as a, as a new world order, a new educational order for the foreseeable future? Uh, I think the simple answer is uh, that we're not entirely sure at this point. And I wish I had something more profound to say right now. Um, you know, lawyers, we, we often say that our answer for everything is it depends. Um, <laughs> and we're in a time of it depends. I try to avoid the word precedent in these days, but, but, um, but definitely a time of it depends. Um, there's a there's sort of two parts to your question. One is how many um, international students will be continue to be interested in an American uh, legal training. Um, we've seen those numbers increase over many years, interested both in the JD and in other programs that schools offer uh, for all of the reasons that my colleagues have already discussed in terms of the power of the law as tool as a tool and also uh, just in terms of the training that it provides to go on and do anything that you might want to do in the future. So if we assume that there will be the same or increased interest, and certainly in the time of COVID-19, uh, when we realize that we need many different people with different kinds of perspectives and backgrounds and training scientists, economists, entrepreneurs, and others to come into law school and to sort of fertilize the discussions that might be happening there, we hope that people will continue to want to come. Um, I think it will be interesting to see what law schools might do to incentivize that. And that sort of segues into the second part of your question, which is whether or not people can physically come. Um, right. So all of us right now in um, JD programs in the U.S. right now are are wondering who's going to show up in August and how many people will be allowed to show up in August and in what ways. Um, and so this question of, of whether people can come even if they want to is a really critical one. Uh, there are some real logistical challenges. I, I think um, as much as we like technology to be the solution for everything, it's six o'clock in the morning to me right now. There are, there are issues as far as timing um, and the question of whether or not instruction is going to be live, going to be recorded, how that changes the pedagogy, um, how that fundamentally potentially changes uh, the law school education. However, I think most U.S. law schools are seeing that as an opportunity. Uh, we were thrown, whether we wanted to be or not to be, into uh, online and remote education. And we find ourselves in a place where it is the new normal, another phrase that gets thrown around a lot, um, but uh, where it's not going anywhere. Um, and so I think this is a time for innovation, and I think that that innovation will likely lead to new solutions being generated, and particularly, particularly solutions that allow us to maintain the diversity that we have had over the last decades. 
Um, diversity in the in U.S. legal education is incredibly, incredibly important. Uh, the quality of the conversations in the classrooms, the quality of the dialogue, the issues raised, the practice that people get in interacting with real people in the real world makes a tremendous difference. And without that, everyone's education suffers and our institution suffers. Um, and so I, I have no doubt that uh, we will be innovative and do what we need to do in order to make sure, not just that we're able to maintain the kind of diversity we've had in the past, including international students, but potentially to enhance that using new tools. Thank you, Christine, for your very candid remarks and uh, in many ways a very sincere uh, set of remarks. Uh, I want to apologize for this, uh, you know, a, odd time for you to have joined this conversation but thank you very much for being there um all right kelly so the big question um i mean you know all of us know the extraordinary contribution of lsac as an organization and lsat as an examination uh, lsat has been seen and uh, respected as the gold standard in legal education for over seven decades with focus on logical and analytical reasoning and reading comprehension so my question to you is that how can we ensure that the admissions process into law schools in the US, in India, but also beyond, uh, complements, uh, the test itself complements by measuring other requirements for a successful uh, you know, law school candidate? Because ideally, the objective for which the L L LSAT is designed is to uh, select students who are most suitable to become effective lawyers. So how do those goals and aspirations get met in the larger scheme of uh, LSAC and LSAT. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. And uh, it's so good to be with you today. Let me say before I answer your uh, uh, very uh, apt question, uh, we really admire the Jindal Law School for its focus on global legal ed and, uh, and fairness to the applicants with the use of the LSAT. So I wanna congratulate you on all you're doing in India and also let everyone in India know that our hearts go out to you for suffering through this pandemic as we all have been. And uh, we remain hopeful that you're staying as safe and well as possible. Um, the question that you've posed about admission is such a critical one. And it is what we think about day and night at, at LSAC because we're devoted to quality access and equity in law school admission. And one of the things that we try very hard to remember and to urge our schools that we work with is that you're admitting people you're admitting people. And those are those persons that you're looking at are have a full range of humanity that deserves consideration. And academic measures such as the LSAT or the GPA, those are important dimensions because they show whether the student's likely to succeed in law school. And to be fair, in admitting, you want to make sure that that aptitude and, and that uh, potential is there. But you also want to make sure that you realize it's just at the start of the education and you want to give people a chance to flourish and to grow intellectually and to thrive and to be lawyers like Deans Washburn and Carpenter have said our society needs so much. So we constantly urge a holistic approach to admission that considers the LSAT, the GPA, and that it also remembers that even embedded within those academic measures are measures of skills that might go beyond what we sometimes think of as just academic. Because I can tell you that to prepare for the LSAT and to do well in undergrad or to do well in, in preparatory school, you have to be organized, you have to be dedicated, you have to have some resilience, usually some teamwork. Um, so there's really a lot of skills there. But we also think it important to look at the full range of the candidates' background. What have been their leadership experiences? What diversity do they bring to the class? Because we know a diverse class is a better class. So we, uh, we constantly try and focus on a holistic approach. And uh, the LSAT is clearly a cornerstone of that because the skills it reviews are in fact the skills that help one succeed in law school. So we think of it as an on-ramp to the learning that you need to thrive in law school and beyond. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly, for that. Uh, let me move to Jason. Jason, you know, one of the things that students who have taken the LSAT examination in India 
as opposed to even the uh, older examinations such as the CLAT and the ILET and other examinations, they feel that it's, they, they have said time and again, it's an intelligent person's examination. You know, it, it requires a certain type of, uh, you know, thinking and perspective to be able to do that exam well. Uh, so uh, can you talk to us a bit about the kind of framework that the LSAT examination uh, has adopted with a view to uh, sort of identify those set of skills uh, that will ultimately be useful for a uh, successful lawyer. Sure, thank you, uh, Dr. Kumar, for uh, having me on here and uh, uh, giving me a chance to, to talk to your viewers. So uh, first of all, I'd like to also make an important announcement, which is that the uh, LSAT India this year is actually going to be um, uh, held a little bit later in the summer than we had originally planned. This gives everybody uh, more, a little bit more time to prepare uh, and, and uh, I think is going to make for a, a smoother, better, uh, more secure and, and safer experience for everybody. So the test date uh, window now begins on July 19th, and we'll be putting out a lot of information, as I'm sure you will, uh, on our website, uh, discoverlaw.india. Well, first of all, I want to express our sincere appreciation on behalf of a large number of Indian students, because as you know, the Central Board of Secondary Education India had announced its 12th standard examination, uh, you know, to be extended till 15th of July. And there were concerns among the students with regard to the LSAT examinations prior, previous date, which was on 14 June. And I'm very delighted to hear from you that the examination now is going to be held on the 19th of July, which will enable a larger number of Indian students who are aspiring to study law to take that test. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's it's a it's a it's an, a fun little game trying to find exactly the right time to to, to hold the test. But I think we've uh, we found a good a good slot, and I hope that uh, everyone that uh, wants to, to participate will get a chance. So let me uh, return back to your question about um, the the skills that the LSAT India and the LSAT tests, and uh, I think that the, at at the bottom uh, these are skills having to do as we call under the umbrella of critical thinking, and. Uh, the, the skills that you would need in, in law school are particularly um, those skills of being able to read critically. And that doesn't just, doesn't just mean being able to understand the text. It means interrogating the text. It means asking a lot of questions. That's essentially what a critical thinker is, is someone who asks questions, who isn't satisfied with just taking in information, but really sort of wants to know more uh, and wants to know why and wants to uh, identify areas where things could be better understood. So when you're a critical reader, um, you, you read your texts with specifically sort of that attitude. And um, as you can well imagine, that kind of skill is very useful as a lawyer uh, whenever you're pouring through uh, the copious amounts of documents and so forth that you have to read, looking for uh, you know, that, that little bit of information that uh, is critical, or crucial to whatever problem you're trying to solve. So critical thinking uh, is sort of the broad umbrella and critical reading specifically is, uh, is what we test in the reading comprehension section of the test. We have a couple of other types of questions. Uh, one we call logical reasoning. Uh, this is a, 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 a type of question that is really, really narrowly focused on very specific kinds of critical thinking ch uh, challenges uh, and skills having to do with identifying um, conclusions of arguments or identifying ways in which arguments are flawed in various ways. Um, obviously, lawyers want to be able to find out when, when an argument has a gap or a hole in it or is, uh, is, is an error in some way. So uh, those are the kinds of skills that the logical reasoning questions uh, assess. And finally, we have a type of question called analytical reasoning. And it's really just focused on being able to reason your way uh, to conclusions about a scenario uh, given some, some, some rules. So it's very much like applying the law to, uh, to the facts uh, of the world. And uh, it's, it's strictly speaking, it's deductive reasoning. Uh, and it's a very, again, it's a very narrow, but very critical and important skill that you're going to need as a, as a law student and as a lawyer. And we have found that the combination of these three types of questions uh, are very, very good at predicting um, how well you'll do in the, in the first, first few months and, and years of law school. So um, it's, a, it's, it's a test that has sort of evolved over the decades to 
get rid of things that don't actually add any value to that predictive task, which is what law, law admissions uh, folks want. So for instance, many, many years ago, decades ago, we used to have something like a, a GK section on the LSAT. Uh, but uh, after you know, uh, intense study and scientific analysis, which we have a whole, a whole department dedicated to, it was discovered that the GK didn't actually add anything of value to the prediction of how students would do in law school. So uh, ultimately it just took on the appearance of being an obstacle uh, rather than a help uh, to, to the people who are aspiring to go to law school and to the people who are trying to decide who to admit to law school. So uh, th those are the, the sort of the big picture about the LSAT India. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, let's, let me move to Kevin. Kevin, I, I'm sure you remember in, in 1987, there was a movie uh, titled Wall Street. Michael Douglas played a role in that uh, on God, uh, Gordon Gecko's role. And famously, Michael Douglas observes greed is good. And of course, we, it took several decades, including the subprime mortgage crisis in the United States for business schools to think in terms of uh, something called ethics that we need to teach to our business school students. And now the question that I have for you is that with emerging demand for social justice and increased requirement of sensitivity, compassion, uh, and emotional intelligence uh, for law students and lawyers in treating legal issues born particularly in relation to COVID, but also beyond, how should the selection criteria of law schools evolve to attract students with a higher level of emotional quotient? Thank you, Dr. Kumar. I think one of the things that we ask, and I think that this comes through in a lot of the personal statements that um, students submit with their applications is, is that we ask them to answer the questions like, do you want to help people? You know, that is one of the important, most important things that lawyers do because people come to lawyers with their most serious problems. Um, if they're getting a divorce, if they're facing a criminal action, um, if they're trying to put together a really good economic deal. There are all kinds of reasons people go to lawyers and most of them are very, very important. Um, so do you want to help people is an important um, thing we need to know about a person. Um, do you want to change the world? That's another one. That's another one that um, as, we see, you know, as we've seen lawyers do. Do you wanna pursue justice? There's all kinds of things that um, lawyers need to, they need to have the right motivations. And um, just as in the, the Wall Street movie, you recognize uh, you referenced with the comment greed is good you know markets aren't always good and um, uh, and and they're they're good in principle what they do is really really important but um, devoid of values and devoid of morality um, they're 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 really weak right so lawyers are some of the people that help to apply the ethics and the morality to markets. And so we need to um, have people that intellectually can do well on exams like the LSAT, um, but that they've got a moral compass as well. And so we do need people with high levels of EQ, people that can understand how to help other people. And it's not just in the head, sometimes it's in the heart. And both of those um, components are really, really important. And we have to be able to measure those things and that's why, as, as, um, as Kelly Testi said, we don't look just at the LSAT score. We also look at the whole application because we need to see what other people say about this in the letter, this person in the letter of recommendations. We need to see what motivates them as they write about it in their personal essay. So it really does take a really fulsome view of a person to admit someone to law school and help train them to become a lawyer. Um, that's very important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, so Megan, uh, there is... You know, I think it'll be a very good opportunity for us to hear a bit uh, from you about how your law school has attempted to address uh, this crisis in the sense that to what extent the teaching, the you know, entire research environment, the learning ecosystem, uh, of course, you mentioned a bit about online teaching, but the whole you know, governance of the law school, how has it changed for you as the dean of a premier law school? Well, there are days that I have thought in the past that, oh, if I could just work from home for a day, and, and I think we've all gotten that, um, that wish in <laughs> perhaps more than we ever wanted. Um, but our law school has, it's, it's one of four law schools in the United States that have an ABA approved 
mostly online law degree, um, JD degree. And um, so over the last couple of years, we have sought to create a program and, and our school really focuses a lot on intellectual property and technology issues. And so those are um, certainly issues that have a, a global legal framework and legal presence that's, that's very important. So over the last few years, we have been working to make sure that students, whether they're participating in our programs online or residentially, have access to all student services equally. So we've already kind of figured out how to make sure that our library is, um, that we have basically a virtual library, um, that we provide access to all of our programming online. And um, so for us, it was a relatively seamless transition for the infrastructure from um, you know, kind of being in person and having face-to-face -face instruction to really running the law school from our, um, from our homes and, and home offices and kitchens and, and um, living rooms. One of the interesting things that I have seen in our uh, online programming, because we offer an LLM and master's in intellectual property and commerce and technology, both residentially and online, to, um, to law students around the world. And we have a lot of students from, from India. And I think one of the things that we have seen through our online programming is that we can access, you know, provide a, a top legal education to diverse populations of students who may not be in a position otherwise to move, um, you know, uh, Across, around the world to, to get um, you know, a top legal education in IP. So we're really excited by the, the increase in technology in these ways because it fits a lot of the programming and the interests that, that we have developed over the years and enables us to kind of work together to have students in a classroom together, students that are in India, in China, in Brazil, in Germany, and in the United States all together working with from diverse perspectives to solve problems. And we've seen, um, I think, too, in the practice of law that the incorporation of technology into law practice itself has really changed the legal services industry in, in so many ways. And so representing the ability to, to work with vulnerable populations, um, you know, technology facilitates that in, in unique ways. So uh, being familiar and comfortable with these kinds of tools and being able to truly have what we, a global classroom, which is what we have right now as we're all speaking. Um, it gives me chills and goosebumps to see all of us together, you know, like this, having these conversations. And, um, and, and it's only through technology that we can do that. So I see enormous potential for the practice of law and um, for us, we've been fortunate because we already had the infrastructure in place to really um, put it put it into action. Thank you so much, Megan, for that uh, very hopeful and indeed an optimistic possibilities that are going to emerge through this. Uh, Christine, so in, a, in, a, in some ways, one of the big questions in the minds of a lot of young people in India, aspiring law graduates uh, and who are planning to study abroad, particularly even at UC Berkeley and other places, is that what is going to happen to their immediate future? What is it that you can, I know you may not be able to say many things now, but what is it that you can tell those students who are aspiring to study in the United States? We have, we have, there are dual degree possibilities. There are other types of internationalization which have been promoted, even our law school has done it. But if you were to speak to these aspiring law graduates uh, who want to come to US for their master's degrees, what, what would you like to tell them? Uh, that you can do it and that law schools will be here. Uh, we are not um, on the verge of uh, disappearing. We're on the verge of innovating, I think, and iterating, right? Like the need that has been so eloquently addressed already by other panelists exists and has only been exacerbated by the crisis that we're fighting. And so, uh, the call for lawyers, and I think many lawyers do think about this profession as a calling, but the call for that is louder and more clear than it has been in years past. So legal education in the US will remain and legal education in the US will innovate. Just listening to the panelists today, 
We're all from very different schools. Um, I think Dean Carpenter is, you know, incredibly ahead of the game in from the perspective that they had already built um, an online education sort of platform and had a way of framing that and thinking of it. But the, we just talked about the underlying skills that lawyers have and people who work in law schools are by and large lawyers. Uh, we see problems and we roll up our sleeves and we get in and we look for solutions to them. Um, and so I think that the range of options and possibilities for people to earn a law degree from a US law school will only be expanded in the future. This is not actually a period of contraction in legal education from my perspective. It's a period of expansion and a period of innovation. We need to figure out how to deliver the quality education and how to produce the lawyers that our societies and that the world needs in new and different ways in the face of this crisis. So I think it's a time what I would tell students is to be optimistic, uh, to plan to come to law school if that is their dream to make connections. We are now more connected than ever before. So it's entirely reasonable for someone to attend a webinar and learn about Berkeley Law or learn about Iowa Law or learn about any other law school from the comfort of their own home and their own time or to watch a video. So if anything, I'd say that the resources and the information is more at people's fingertips. The demand for uh, innovative thinking on, from our perspective is higher and the need in our world is greater. Um, this is a fantastic time to consider law school um, and we, we look forward and welcome those applications. Thank you very much, uh, Christine, for that response. Uh, uh, Kelly, let me ask you uh, the question relating to the future of LSAT itself. You know, amidst this anxiety among aspiring law students, not just in India, but beyond, beyond uh, regarding the future of their academic pursuits, an unprecedented technological disruption has been made by LSAC. It has demonstrated leadership. For the first time ever, LSAT India has become India's first and only law entrance examination to be entirely online, artificial intelligence enabled and remote proctored examination. One question in the minds of many is how can we ensure the required integrity, efficiency, security and transparency in this format of the exam. And does this represent a need of the R or the future of law school entrance examinations itself? Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kumar. It's such an important question because fairness and security uh, are also so critical when you're looking at it, uh, admission exams or any kind of high stakes exams. and. That's something that we're so devoted to. So I wanna let you know, first of all, that one of the things that uh, we thought so much about is that this is obviously not a way of testing that we had never considered. You know, We are constantly innovating, constantly looking for what should come next, what should you know, achieve that correct balance of candidate convenience and security. And, uh, and so if this were easy to do, I wanna say that a lot of us would have already done it. Um, it, uh, it has a number of, uh, of considerations that we had to really put our best people on. And uh, one of the things that we have really come to see is that I think as many of the other panelists have mentioned, the time of, uh, of the pandemic has been one of great uh, innovation. And so some things that we thought might take many months or even a year or more to advance, we've been able to work very quickly and very hard to advance them. And finding the right balance of security and convenience and transparency has been one where we've made enormous quick progress. And I really give my colleagues at LSAC so much credit for this because it is their expertise, their research over many decades their long experience in the field of testing that allowed us to get out of the gate very quickly so that we could respond to this pandemic in responsible ways. And what we intend to do then is to really learn from these administrations and that will inform how we think about the future of testing. But I can let everyone know that there are a number of different ways that we ensure security uh, both at the time of the exam in terms of the candidate who's sitting for it, and also a number of ways that our research and our oversight can also detect irregularities um, and that we could then address. 
So we are very pleased to be able to bring this forward in this emergency time. Uh, as my colleagues on the panel have noted, there's never been a more important time to keep the pipeline of lawyers rolling. And so LSAC is very proud to step up and make sure that we can help let every candidate continue their journey, even amid this pandemic where travel and gatherings are restricted. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly, for that uh, very forthright and indeed uh, useful answer for many who are looking forward to LSAC's leadership. Uh, for all the viewers, we are live on YouTube, and I hope you are sending in those questions as we begin to take up some of those questions very shortly. Uh, all right, let me move to Kevin. Uh, Kevin, uh, this the Stoddard and Furson and Yale exams, as we are aware, uh, faded in the United States, and it progressed to Frank Bowles' vision of a single law school entrance examination in the form of an LSAT. How has an independent and standardized entrance examination benefited the students and possibly the entire legal education landscape? Has this indeed added to the transparency in the admission process? Uh, what would be your feed feedback and experience sharing for other countries like India, including, uh, including India, which are which have been uh, working with LSAC and LSAT in uh, India for a decade now, and it is beginning to develop a certain degree of maturity and stability. What would be your, uh, let's say, feedback for those uh, countries? Thank you, Dr. Kumar. So our experience here in the United States was that before the, the LSAT, before the law school admission test, as admission to law school was often based not on what you knew, but who you knew. Did you know a, a, a professor who was well-connected and did you work for them and did they help you along? And um, it, it, what it did is it perpetuated the elite. It, it made sure that the people that were already well-connected or already wealthy could, you know, could get those seats in law school. And the LSAT was really helped to develop us to get beyond that. How do we allow other people who are not well connected show that they've got the intellectual firepower to be able to succeed in law school? And it's really done that. The genius of the LSAT um, in the United States has been that it helps identify the best students regardless of whether they're elite or whether they have strong socioeconomic background. The LSAT does not ask who your parents are. It doesn't ask what socioeconomic level you come from. It doesn't ask what neighborhood did you grow up in. It doesn't even ask where you went to school, right? What it says is, can you solve this problem that's right before you? And um, can you demonstrate that you can solve that problem? And um, if you can solve that problem, you know, it gives you a, a path. Um, it gives you the ability to develop your own, um, and to show your own intellectual horsepower, you know, your own intellectual um, capabilities. And that's the genius of the LSAT. Anybody can sit for the LSAT. And if they can succeed on it, they can show no matter what their background was, they can succeed. They're really smart, you're right? They're really capable. And they've got the intellectual, the raw intellectual ability that can be morphed into an excellent attorney. And so that's the real genius of the LSAT. That's what we have learned in the United States is the LSAT can do that and nothing else can do it as well. Uh, most other things are really focused on, um, you know, badges of elitism or something like that. But a, a common person can take the LSAT and demonstrate their, you know, their, their aptitude. So okay. it's been a really good improvement here in the, in the U.S. And I think it can help um, break down the, you know, elites in other places and allow other people in other countries to have great opportunity. Thank you very much, Kevin. In fact, whatever you said, Kevin, about uh, what used to happen in the United States has also a very similar trend uh, it does take place in India as well. And one of the reasons why Jindal Global Law School, when it, uh, when it was founded in the year 2009, we began with the LSAT India as a, the only examination, so to say, for admitting our students, uh, was part of that uh, effort to have a more transparent, inclusive, and democratizing process in relation to legal education. Um, thank you for your response. Uh, Megan, uh, as Kevin mentioned that all of us as uh, you know, educational administrators and law professors are very conscious about that very process of making the uh, selection process transparent. Now, one of the, one of the uh, critiques of LSAT and LSA, LSAC in general would argue that uh, this creates new forms of, let's say, uh, privileges 
uh, I, you know, there are, you know, testing centers and uh, coaching centers and prep schools and others which are involved in preparing, uh, you know, uh, people for taking the LSAT. And there are, uh, that also creates another form of class in itself. So how can we respond to that criticism? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Um, you know, the LSAT, the LSAT is an incredible tool because it does all of the things that, that Kevin was just mentioning. It sort of it gives an objective assessment, but it's not the only assessment. And so, you know, one of the things that's really important to remember is that there is not one thing that is going to be the answer to your law school application. Um, law schools want to look at candidates holistically. They want to see the whole person. They want to see what your background is, where your passions lie. Um, uh, you know, uh, they want to consider your personal statement and, um, you know, what your experiences have been and, and what you're interested in achieving as you go forward. So I think that it's really important. It's almost like a false dichotomy to say, um, you know, well, is this, you know, that are we going to criticize the LSAT because it doesn't do everything? Well, it's not designed to do everything. It is one tool in a, in a, you know, a big toolkit. And so I would encourage students to really consider it in that context. Um, and, and we want to make sure, and I know that Kelly has done an excellent job of, of trying to make sure that that this test can be accessible to more people than ever before. So recently, um, you know, LSAC has been offering um, the LSAT in the United States and at, at home in a flexible manner. Um, so as she had mentioned, you know, we're all innovating in, in ways that we perhaps faster than in organizations than, than we typically would. And I think that's good. Ultimately, that's good because there are vulnerable, vulnerable populations out there that need good lawyers. And so we are, you know, I know that, that LSAC has done an, an excellent job of trying to make the test more available and, and continues to do so, you know, in India as well. So. Um, you know, I, I think one piece in the toolkit is something important to remember and also, you know, recognizing the innovations that are happening to, to reach populations that we haven't been able to before. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Megan, for that. I will say one thing from Indian standpoint, at least general standpoint, and I, while I take your point, both what Kevin and what you said, uh, that we need to have multiple criteria uh, to select students uh, at Jindal Global Law School, potentially, possibly, uh, um, you know, people may disagree with our method, but we use only the LSAT. In fact, we have, uh, we have not, we don't take anything else into account. And for all the reasons that Kevin mentioned, that our goal was to have a purely objective criteria for selecting students. And we feared the possibility of any form of uh, subjectivity, potentially discretion infused into the selection process. And we took a call because we are still, uh, we are only a decade old. As we progress, we can think in terms of having other criteria as well. But uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, the concerns that Kevin mentioned uh, in the early phase of uh, US legal education, those things uh, do, does matter in the Indian context. Uh, thank you very much, Megan. Uh, Christine, so my question to you is that since as we hear Kevin and Megan talk about the way students are being selected, one of the things that is in the minds of uh, uh, law students potentially now is that, um, are there studies that you have seen which see correlation between LSAT performance as well as, you know, career trajectories? Uh, you may or may not have it handy, but I'm, I'm curious to understand Berkeley as a law school its own approach towards, you know, the studying the relationship between classroom performance and potential success into becoming a lawyer and their LSAT uh, grades. Are, what's, what's the uh, situation in Berkeley in, the, in this regard? Well, I, I, Kelly may be too, thank you for the question, Dr. Kumar. Kelly may be too modest to, to bring all of this up, and it would be a webinar entirely about all the services that LSAC provides, but LSAC provides a lot of services to, to law schools in the U.S., and, and one of those services is, um, is some sort of supporting services around the LSAC, 
right, LSAT. Um, so uh, guidance about how to properly contextualize and understand scores in the um, as part of a holistic admissions process, and then also analysis of uh, the the correlations between LSAT performance, undergraduate record or grade point average, and first year law performance. Um, I think LSAC also does a really wonderful job of encouraging us not to try to think about the LSAC as LSAT is doing things that it isn't designed to do. So it isn't designed to um, predict th three years of law school grades. Uh, that's the length of the JD program typically in the US. It isn't designed to predict bar pass. It isn't designed to predict success or satisfaction in uh, the profession. It may be very helpful with those things. It is, but the beauty and the, the elegance and the utility from our perspective and why it really is the gold standard for, for US law schools in terms of evaluating candidates is that it's so good at doing this thing that it does that's so important for us in the admissions process, which is helping us understand how people will do in the first year of law school in combination with other factors, in particular with academic record. Um, so we often think of getting into Berkeley Law as a, as a two, maybe three part test. But the, the first question is always, do I believe that you can come and do the work? So we don't admit people and then weed them out, right? This isn't trial by fire. Uh, this isn't the paper chase. We expect everyone to finish and get to the, to the end. Um, and so we're very, very risk averse, frankly. Uh, we want to make sure that people will be successful. And the LSAT, in combination with academic record, which is more than just grade point average, it's academic record, what you majored in, all of those other things, what your letter writers have to say about you. But those two factors can be extremely helpful in answering that question. Do I think you can come and do the work? Because LSAC does provide correlation studies and data to us, and there has been substantial research that shows that the LSAT is very effective at predicting first year performance, particularly when combined with academic record. Um, I will say though that for us, you know, we have many thousands of applications, as do my colleagues, um, and um, we're lucky, therefore, and I think of it as a privilege, we get to ask other questions. Um, and so we also ask things like, what will you contribute beyond being smart, right? So I sometimes say that, that um, coming to law school, for coming to law school, intelligence is a necessary but not sufficient condition. Uh, and that gets back to your point about emotional intelligence. We have a lot of smart people. I'm not going to admit all of them. Um, I'm happy to have more than I could possibly choose from. Uh, so we want to know what you will contribute beyond that. And the other parts of the application will be helpful for us in understanding that. I sometimes I say sometimes a third part of that, that test or a third hurdle because sometimes I also think about whether or not I'd like to um, go grab a cup of coffee with you. Um, and that's not to say that you have to make me uh, happy, but we can disagree about everything, but rather can you engage in sort of um, personal conversation, build rapport, build relationships, work with different kinds of people, have, you know, carry on a conversation. Can I imagine you in the classroom? And that is largely informed by um, the sort of qualitative aspects of an application. Um, but yeah, there, to answer your question, the short answer is yes. There's, there's lots of research that shows that the LSAT is extremely effective at doing the things that the LSAC says it would do. Um, and all of us in legal education must constantly be self-cautioning about using it for things that it is not designed to do. Thank you so much, uh, Christine. That was fascinating. Uh, Kelly, uh, there is, uh, uh, by the way, for all our panelists, we have already got over 100 questions. And uh, we will soon get back to the 100. I don't know how many we will. Uh, for all those viewers, Please uh, continue your, we will get back definitely to questions. Uh, Kelly, um, you know, multiple submissions of different documents uh, and entrance exam scores can often be perceived as a, a overhead for students applying to law schools. And I know that LSAC offers a very important service called Credential Assembly Service, which pretty much centralizes a major portion of the application process for the students in USA. So the question is, it'll be useful for many viewers to understand what are the benefits of this process and uh, can this kind of an approach to be is can be seen as a future in the Indian context as well. I uh, really love this service that we provide this uh, credential assembly service because it really fits so well with our goal of trying to eliminate any barrier for a candidate applying to law school, we want to make that easy 
and convenient and affordable. And this really helps the candidates because we're the, the hub, if you will, and they can apply to us and then tell us what schools they want to uh, actually uh, make application to. And then we can fan that out so that they're doing something just once many times rather than multiple times. And that saves time, that saves money, that saves a lot of convenience for the candidate. The other thing it does is, uh, and I really appreciate my colleague Kristen's comments about the services LSAC provides, is it also really helps our schools because LSAC then verifies those transcripts. We help um, compare GPAs across institutions. Uh, we do a lot of the work that our schools would otherwise individually have to do. And many of our schools have told me that they would probably have to have several more people in their admission office uh, full time if we didn't provide that service. And so this really helps connect the candidates to the law schools. And it really helps the schools save investment in personnel. It helps the candidates uh, have a lot greater convenience. So I do believe, uh, Raj, that any kind of admission system would be enhanced by using something like this. It is, uh, you know, and we're, we're eager to, uh, to talk about that with schools that are interested in, in that service. It is uh, very much something that I think overall enhances the enrollment process for everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Kelly, for that. Uh, um, I think, th I, I suppose in due course, it may be possible to bring this kind of service into India as well. Um, Kevin, uh, since LSAC uh, or LSAT in the U.S. has begun to operate somewhat, you know, in um, remote proctor type of a situation, uh, it will be useful for us to, and for many viewers, to talk a little bit about what kind of potential barriers it can actually overcome and in some ways how it can help fulfill certain special needs, particularly those who come from economically disadvantaged background and how, let's say, their own limited technology infrastructure uh, at home settings may pose challenges for even conducting that type of exam. If you can briefly reflect as the chair of the Board of Trustees, uh, I believe it will be very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. And your, your, um, your question sort of raises two different issues um, for me. One of them is that um, we have to make sure that people of all sort of different physical capacities can take the LSAT exam, even if they've got um, physical handicaps and that sort of thing, you know, personal disabilities, because we want to, we're trying to, you know, measure people's intellectual prowess and their aptitude um, rather than are they in a wheelchair or something like that. So we, we want to make sure the LSAT is, a, you know, accessible to everyone regarding their, regardless of their physical abilities. That's, that's one thing. And that's been really, we've really improved in the U.S. dramatically around those issues in the last few years. And we think it's a great step forward in our, in our civilization here. Um, secondly, we need to make sure that people that are on the other side of the so-called digital divide, people that don't live in communities that have great Wi-Fi service or something like that, that they can still access, access the exam. And um, we are trying various different ways and looking at different approaches to that to make sure that those that everyone can take the exam. In the US, we have just moved to the digital LSAT before the pandemic, which is we sent out um, um, tablet computers for people to take the LSAT exam on. That was a new a new approach. And um, and 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 so people didn't have to bring their own computer um, or to, to an uh, an exam site. That they were they were each handed a, a tablet. Um, now one of the things that we are at least considering or looking at is um, testing centers, so that people come into a specific testing center as a place if they don't have you know Wi-Fi at home or they don't have the um, technological capabilities at home there's another way that they can access the test. And so we are really trying to carefully make sure that um, people that are economically disadvantaged or technologically disadvantaged in rural areas, for example, are still able to take the exam. And that's really important to us because we believe that we've got a, a great uh, test here and we want to make sure that people, wherever they are, and in what other circumstances they live in, they can they can take this exam and, and prove themselves. So, so those are things that we're really thinking about and working on. Um, and they have to be um, examined differently in every environment, but we are making real strides in that area. 
Thank you very much, Kevin. That's a uh, fantastic uh, contributions that uh, LSAC is making to provide access. Um, Megan, uh, since you have you have been at the vanguard of promoting online education and digital learning, and even transform the JD program, uh, I would appreciate if you can reflect a bit on some of the challenges relating to online education, in particular, uh, you know, attention deficit in, in some extent, to what extent clinical legal education programs, pro bono type activities, um, experiential learning, and even peer group uh, learning. Uh, how does a law school address those type of issues in online education? And to what extent blended learning uh, would contribute to addressing some of those issues? I get so excited when I talk about these things. So I'm hoping, okay, I'm gonna to try to keep it short, but I get, I, I'm, I get passionate. One of the big mistakes I think we could potentially make um, is that if, if we just try to replicate what we do in person, if we try to replicate that online, um, the, the educational experience that we can have that uses technology um, provides different tools for us and different opportunities for us. But it's not great for students to, you know, th there might be attention deficit issues when you, you know, as you mentioned, when um, someone just sits in front of a computer listening to a lecture for 90 minutes or two hours at a time. But technology enables us to do things that, that we wouldn't even be able to do in face-to-face -face instruction. So for example, um, when I'm teaching a, a large lecture class, I would ask a question of maybe, three students. And once the, those three students have answered the question, somehow I'm imputing that knowledge onto the other you know, 80 students in, in the classroom. But when you're engaging with people online, you can ask hypothetical questions and, and each student is answering um, you know, in their own, they're, they're writing it out a thoughtful response. Um, and you can see very clearly how each student analyzes the problem and addresses, sort of structures their argument, and they get to practice their writing, which is such an important skill. Um, we also use technology to do group office hours, which is something I had never done in person, where you know maybe I'll have eight or 10 people online, and, and one of them asks a question in, in, during our office hour, but then another one will learn from that and then build on that with, with their own question. Um, and you can still use breakout rooms and you know, there's so many opportunities to do things uniquely that involve peer-to-peer -peer learning and professor sort of instruction as well. And then practicing writing and, and legal analysis um, that, that all are accomplishing the learning objectives, but they're doing it in unique ways. And so I think the most effective online learning experiences for us are where we're thinking of you know how we accomplish the objectives rather than how we replicate the classroom experience um, and that really extends to you know using with experiential education and clinics and moot courts all of that you know when when lawyers are representing clients it's not as common anymore for clients to just walk into an office and say, hey, I have a legal problem in it and I need help. Lots of uh, representation happens using technology through email, through exchange of documents, through um, you know, video calls or phone calls. And so it's really important that we're educating our students to practice law, not as it existed 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but that we're teaching our students to practice law um, for what's coming up five to 10 years from now. And so I think, you know, online learning really prepares students too for the realities of the practice of law now in a way that we perhaps weren't doing just a few years ago. Thank you so much, uh, Megan, for that. Uh, Christine, what, let me ask you probably one of the most difficult questions. Uh, <laughs> The University of Cambridge just three days ago announced that they will make the entire uh, next academic year online. Till 2021, they've decided to go online. Now, of course, I know universities around the world are thinking about what they need to do. What do you have to tell the students when they prepare about their future, not just in coming to US, but also US-based students uh, 
what should they be thinking now? I mean, how can we, as educators, administrators, give them some idea of what is going to happen in the future? It's a tough one. <laughs> Maybe Jason can uh, adopt that one, uh, adapt that one to be on the uh, LSAT India. <laughs> that is a challenging question. Um, I, I, I think as institutions, we're all, you know, juggling so many different variables right now. Some, some of which, I mean, such as the virus are simply entirely out of our control, but other things also out of our control might be what our larger institutions choose to do, even if our law school might choose to do something slightly different, right? Or um, what we might like to do and what the market um, tells us we can actually do, what students will actually go for or support or tolerate or accept or pay for. Um, and so there are a number of things that, that we, we just don't know. Um, and um, uh, it makes it really difficult to, to sort of plan. I, I think this question is perfect after Dean Carpenter's remarks, um, because frankly, uh, the, the things that she hit are the things that law schools are doing and have to be doing moving forward, which is that um, we must reimagine that this isn't about replication, right? That our, that our immediate response when we needed to go to remote instruction was, we will take exactly what we did in the classroom and we will do it from our houses, right? You will log in, you will sit there, you will listen. Um, and that was a completely reasonable, I think, and fairly successful response to finish the semester. Um, but for moving forward, uh, the reality is that we are not going to replicate exactly what you would have done for three years of law school. You're going to have to do something different. And so probably there will be um, a whole host of sort of hybrid options. We'll have people, even if we, even if we announce tomorrow that we were going to go completely in person, there will be faculty members and there will be students who will say, I'm not comfortable with that. Right. I have a member, family member at home who's unwell. Um, I just don't feel like for my own self and personal risk, that's appropriate for me. And so we will have to operate on multiple tracks. I don't think this is a bell that can be unrung. Right. Which is to say, I don't think that we can go back to a place probably in the near term where we aren't also creating virtual learning spaces and opportunities, including ability to, to come together to do clinical work, to do research, and to do uh, sort of community building and collaboration. Uh, so much of what lawyers and law students do is come together and talk, um, and, and in pretty informal ways, in the hallways, in the cafes, in the library, um, and we are often verbal processors. Uh, and so we need to create the spaces for those things. Those are different than just being in the classroom and receiving the information. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, law school will be there. I think it will look different. I think it's going to add more tools to the toolkit. Uh, I take Dean Carpenter's remarks um, very um, seriously with a sense of this is also about what will legal practice look like moving forward, right? There are still clients who need arraignments. Uh, there are still, you know, depositions that need to be taken. Um, and we can do ourselves and our students a favor, in fact, by training them to use the technology now as law students that they will likely be using moving forward as attorneys in their career. Thank you very much, Christine. That was one of the most comprehensive and compelling responses to a very difficult question. Thank you very much. Um, Let's, Kelly, well, we have now reached 175 questions, so we will have to quickly go into the Q&A session. But Kelly, my question to you is, what do you see is the future of LSAC in India? What is the future of LSAT India? As its uh, uh, CEO, I would like you to, uh, to reflect on it a bit. Sure, uh, happy to do that. And uh, we're just so proud to have been working in India now for over a decade. and. One of the things that I think a lot about, Raj, when I think about that question is that in the United States, I think of the Law School Admission Council very much as, as really a hub for legal education. Uh, certainly some, uh, an organization that helps unite the schools and candidates and provides core services and assessment data and technology for schools. And it's really my hope that that full, fuller suite of all the services that LSAC provides can also uh, be helpful in India as legal education continues to prosper. We believe very strongly that the more that one focuses upon quality and access and equity in education, the better the 
experience of candidates, the better the experience of the schools, and more importantly, the stronger the profession and the stronger the rule of law, which as many of the other speakers have noted is so critical to have a society where everyone can truly flourish. So we feel that we have a lot of experience and resources that can continue to align with and partner with the, uh, the schools and, uh, and candidates in India. And we realize in working around the world, of course, that every country, every, uh, everyone has their own system of law and legal education. And uh, we look forward to tailoring what we provide so that that is apt for the locality that we're serving. But we do look forward to bringing that greater set of skills forward uh, to help promote justice and law in India. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, thank you to all of you for uh, now the first segment of our program is ended. Uh, now we move to the Q&A session. I have a number of questions. So there's a question from Chaitanya Kapoor, and this is uh, mostly for Jason. Jason Chaitanya is asking, and many students, including Manav Shah and parents, Pallavi and Shivani, they're all asking about the LSAT India's schedule now. Uh, in, in the public domain, the dates are uh, what it was mentioned before. So if you can reflect about the current status of what it is, when it is, and the deadline for applications and things like that, it will be very useful. Sure. So yes, there has unfortunately been a lot of movement, as I mentioned before, on, uh, on the test dates over these last uh, couple of months uh, as we've tried to respond to, uh, to the, to the uh, situation. Uh, so currently, the test is scheduled to begin, the testing period is scheduled to begin on July 19th. Uh, it will go for uh, a number of days. Um, it, the number of days that it will continue is partly dependent on uh, you know, a number of factors, including how many people end up registering and, and, and how many people we need to test. Uh, but it looks like it will uh, extend for probably four to five days or maybe even six. So uh, it, uh, it will be a, uh, a, a situation where a student will be assigned a slot uh, to test in because there will be multiple slots of testing over those days. And as far as when uh, registration ends, uh, currently I, I believe the registration end date is the 5th of July. So we will be extending that, uh, that date as well. Uh, we are really focused on trying to uh, uh, create as smooth uh, process as possible. So there's a lot of, a lot of parts to, that we still are still working on, obviously. Uh, but we also really want to give everyone who uh, wants to take the test an opportunity to do so. So that's also par partly why we moved the test date, as you mentioned earlier. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, Kevin, there is a question about, uh, you know, uh, students and even law aspirants who are thinking about how uh, artificial intelligence and robotics and machine learning can potentially shape the future of the legal profession? I mean, that's a question which many students are, and maybe even parents are asking, Himanshu, Aditya, and uh, Annapurni and others. Dr. Kumar, I will tell you that AI is actually, um, it's a very exciting technology, and I think we're all going to be grappling with it. Um, and I think we've actually been surprised about all the things that it can do. Um, when you have new technologies like this, though, the need for, you know, smart human minds are, is even greater, though, and good problem solvers. And we're going to need um, to have um, lawyers and legislators making policy around how artificial intelligence is used. Um, applying it to new circumstances and new situations. Um, that's a situation where we are always going to, you know, need lawyers helping to guide the new circumstances that the world faces and solving the new problems that artificial intelligence will create. Will artificial intelligence perhaps um, help us solve some, some legal problems? Potentially, um, and and um, working, you know, with lawyers, uh, you know, people, um, intelligent people who can who can manage it, um, it may increase our our abilities. Um, but ultimately, you know, we often, you know, we're often before human judges, and I think we'll always be before human judges because I think courts are not something that we're going to surrender to artificial intelligence. Um, but ultimately, it's going to require human judgment, um, you know. For, for all important decisions and um, AI can be an important tool, but it's really important that we make sure that um, 
humans with with our, with with our minds and hearts are the ones that are um, you know exercising wisdom um, for for many um, important policy decisions and so so AI is a is, a, is an important tool it's not going to supplant lawyers or, or judges or or um, or anyone else I think it's just going to be a tool that we can all use to help make better decisions so it's something that we should all embrace and be and be happy about but um, you know, I don't think robots are going to replace humans anytime soon. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin. Uh, Megan, there are questions from Pratap and Vibor and Manchu and uh, Aditya. They are quite, the questions are, to what extent uh, technology, uh, online uh, education that you talked about, can be used effectively in justice delivery systems, including alternative dispute resolution and the whole range of uh, even uh, you know, court-based uh, justice delivery mechanisms. I think we're realizing the that, you know, across industries, including the legal services industry, you know, how much technology can facilitate in, in different ways. And we're also realizing some of the limitations on that. But really the, the incorporation of technology into law practice, whether it is through alternative dispute resolution, um, through legal research, um, and through direct representation of clients has really ha has been, you know, going on for, for decades now and has created some efficiencies that have changed the way that lawyers work. Um, and those tools don't just make attorneys more efficient, um, but they also require a different set of skills um, than, than was once needed. And so it's important for um, law students and, um, and those of us as leaders in legal education to think about ways that we can train our students, whether you know, in, in the justice system, not just through legal analysis and advocacy, but also in effective ways to interact, if, interact with technology and use technology as, as a tool. Um, you know, firms are also asking for um, students to graduate with certain skills because technology is being incorporated in all of these different ways. Firms are no longer as interested in training students for the first few years and sort of losing money on them um, in those first few years of practice. So um, law schools really need to be thinking about how to get students those higher level skills too that, that Kevin was talking about. Um, so the way I think about it is getting, making sure that students can graduate with the wisdom of their 40s without having to go through their 20s. Um, so it's sort of the, the, those, those higher level processing skills are gonna be used across the system of, of um, legal services industry. Thank you very much, uh, Megan, for that. Uh, um, Christine, there's a question from Anushka Matur as well as uh, uh, Neeraj and Vibor. And this question is about what kind of opportunities can we expect post COVID-19 for students wanting to pursue their LLM in the United States and later possibly even working. And this question is not about 2021. The question is more about 2022 and beyond. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I, I think that um, necessity is the mother of invention um, in all cases. And um, when it comes to LLM programs, um, between the combination of people who are not able to travel for any number of reasons or who don't feel that this is the time that they want to start their legal education in the U.S., um, many schools, ours included, but also a number of peers have started to roll out sort of a range of options. Um, we already had a, a hybrid LLM program, for example, where someone could come multiple summers and earn their LLM, um, as well as what we'd call a traditional track or a single year in residence LLM program. Um, so that was more conducive to people who were professionals and were working and weren't able to take a, a, an entire year off, but could do two chunks of time. Um, and then we have worked with different jurisdictions in terms of being able to take the bar, because there are, as I'm sure you're aware, there are lots of restrictions in terms of which states will allow someone with an LLM and what kind of an LLM um, and to sit for the bar and to practice and to be licensed in their state. None of those things are going to change, although it is interesting to think about in the United States how the state bars are responding um, and, and also the American Bar Association in terms of, of online education for accreditation. But um, 
Uh, we have found, we surveyed students who plan to come in this fall, who'd already been admitted to come in for their LLM, and we found that some of them uh, still wanted to come and would ha be happy to either do that physically, if they were physically here, or remotely. Um, there were other people who wanted to defer a full year, um, and I think that there are lots of schools where maybe they didn't defer admission for LLM programs in the past that may begin now to more routinely defer them. So you could apply, but not actually come yet for another year potentially. Um, and that may be because of visa restrictions or any number of other considerations. Um, we also found that there were a number of students who wanted to wait and come in January of 2021. Uh, we've never had a January start in any program. Um, but there was a pretty significant number of people who said they thought things would be in a better position or they would be in a better position to start at that time. And then of the, that group, there were some who wanted to do January, so spring 2021 and summer 2021, as there are two terms, and others who wanted to do spring 2021 and fall 2021 with the summer as a break in between their two terms. The interesting thing from an enrollment perspective is if you start a January start program, you always have a January start program. And the reason is that, well, A, you, you sort of built it and, and they will come, but also um, that, that, uh, that allowing people to do spring 2021, fall 2021 means there's less physical space, especially with physical distancing in fall 2021 for entering students then. So you have to enroll another group in spring 2022 and so on and so forth. Um, and so I think you're likely to see long-term shifts in in this pattern of start times and in the growth of hybrid programs. Um, we also had a hybrid, a sort of a, an online program where you did a, two semesters of online and one summer in residence. So I think you're just gonna see all of these kinds of sort of a range of options, which is fantastic for the student or the consumer in this case, right? So um, to have schools that have maybe only done one or two things now offer you six or seven options that might be the right thing for you based on the COVID-19 pandemic, but with or without that might be the right thing for you based on your professional life, your personal life, your interest in spending time in another country, et cetera. Um, and or, or or your pocketbook, right? Like whether or not your firm might be paying for it or how you want to pay for it and some of those things. So I think it's a time of, of real expanded choice. And I don't think that that will shift. Um, I think if anything, it's likely again to expand. Thank you very much, Christine, for that. Uh, uh, this question is for both Kelly and Nathan and Jason. There are lots of questions from Karen and uh, Vandana and Adit and Meghna about the nature of the LSAT India exam. Uh, but of course, this is the first time it's happening online. So maybe you can reflect a bit about what the LSAT exam in the US context is, uh, you know, the way it's conducted in the remote proctored model, and maybe throw some light on how uh, the Pearson View uh, administered exam in LSAT India is going to be. Good. Let me start and then I'll uh, turn it to my colleague Jason uh, for uh, the real details about how it will work in India. But one of the things that we thought was so important is to try and make sure that for candidates who have been preparing for the LSAT, that all that preparation was still going to benefit them so that we maintained the test in the same format as much as possible. And that's something that we were committed to just for that certainty and that predictability first because as uh, other panelists have mentioned, the LSAT is very good at what it does. And so we have tried uh, to maintain that continuity as we've moved to a different mode of testing. And that's something that uh, we think is very important both for the validity and reliability of the exam and also for the candidates' expectations and then how the schools will use that information, those scores. So Jason, let me ask you to talk a little bit about how that will roll out in India with the help of Pearson View, who is the test administration partner that we use there. And uh, that can give candidates some information on what to expect when they get to, uh, to test day so that they're prepared and they're not frightened or, or wary of this. Mm -hmm. Thank sure. you so much for that. Jason, please. Yes, yeah, so uh, the one thing I'll start with is that it's, um, it's a process that will not start on test day. 
Um, there will be extensive communication coming from us and from Pearson View uh, as a coherent uh, a set of instructions about how to uh, get the uh, the program you need and, and the requirements that you'll need for actually taking the test as far as the machine you'll need and the web camera and so on and so forth. So all of that will come and it'll be very clear and it will come in a, in a, in a communication to you if you're registered for us. And we'll also have all this information on our website, much of it is already there. So uh, a few days before the test, you'll, you'll be getting a, specifically a link uh, where you will uh, go through the process of uh, downloading what you need to download. Uh, it's a, a secure browser that locks down your computer so that you cannot access anything else, any other programs or anything like that. And this will give you an opportunity to verify that uh, your machine and your setup actually uh, is, uh, meets all the requirements for taking the test. Um, and then uh, assuming all goes well and, and you're able to uh, resolve any issues that come up with our help, you can always uh, write into us. Uh, your test day experience will begin, as I said before, uh, you'll be assigned a test slot and you'll, you'll log in and it will be very much like uh, taking a paper and pencil test, only the exam will be on the screen and you have to select your answers there. Uh, the, the test will, will uh, transpire over uh, four sections of 35 minutes each. And uh, there's a requirement that you, you take all 35 minutes, um, but once you complete a 35 minute section, you can't move back uh, to a previous section. So you have to, uh, you have to sort of do all of, your, uh, all of your work within that section for those questions. Uh, and then after the, <clears throat> the test is over, you'll, you'll hit a, basically a kind of a submit button and the test will end. And uh, then we'll start take over and do all the scoring work, which will, work, which will come out uh, in due course uh, within a couple of weeks. So uh, I, I hope that answers that, uh, that question. For all the viewers, once again, I want to reiterate what Jason mentioned, that the test, the LSAT India test will be held on 19th July. And uh, apparently the deadline for uh, application relating to this on 5th July, if I understand correctly. Correct. And so you have sufficient time. And as Jason mentioned, there will be a lot more information forthcoming between now, which is 27th May, to the 4th July, which will give you enough understanding as to the entire modus operandi of the test itself. Hang in there, all the students who are waiting to hear. Uh, Kevin, there's a very interesting question from Advait Ja. Now, this question is nothing to do with LSAT. Uh, but it's a very interesting question. And uh, Advait is asking about the fact that is law and legal profession going to be tough, considering that I have good verbal and analytical reasoning skills, but I'm an engineering student. Now, this is something which, if you know a bit of India, you know, most Indians grow up to become doctors or engineers. And then and they do engineering to figure out what they want to do in life. So how do you advise the student? Well, let me say this. I think that engineers make some of the best law students um, because they are accustomed to solving problems. They are uh, accustomed to applying real rules, um, real, you know, the, in the natural world um, uh, to, to fact patterns and to solve problems. And that turns out to be exceedingly important. Um, one of the things that I think engineers often have to learn about is there's, there are more gray areas in, in you know, a field like law, and, and that's challenging for, for engineers sometimes. Um, but um, some of the most successful lawyers uh, have an engineering background, and that's, that's the leap they have to make, though, to be able to deal in an area where there are no absolutes, and there sometimes are not right answers. There's only you know, better or worse arguments. And, um, and so I, you know, in, in the US, I will tell you that it's the engineering people that go to law school who go on to careers in intellectual property and high tech and that sort of thing. And frankly, they do very well financially. Um, um, even mediocre law students, um, if they've got an engineering degree, tend to be very financially successful in the United States because they can access two really important areas of knowledge and bring them together in a way that, um, that many of us cannot. So it's a, it's a very successful path in the United States and a very important path. And so I, I encourage it. We love to get applications from engineering students. Um, deans, deans love that. So I encourage, I encourage the, those students so much very much. Um, Megan, there's a question from Meghna. 
Uh, she, I think it's a very intelligent question, which I'm sure all of us will battle. This question is about how online education possibly raises issues of privacy uh, in the sense that, you know, and this is something which we are also experiencing, which is that, you know, faculty members are talking about various issues and law, particularly issues relating to public law and issues surrounding human rights and areas that have some degree of, let's say, challenging state authority. Uh, those things expressed in a classroom environment and then uh, potentially could be, and obviously we are recording these things in an online setting. So uh, how do you deal with privacy in this context? It's really important for students and faculty to feel comfortable that the classroom setting, whether it's uh, in you know using technology or whether the, it's a, a classroom setting face to face, um, that it, there's an, an opportunity for open dialogue and a free exchange of ideas. That is one of the most critical pieces of, of a legal education. And so I'm I'm grateful for the question because you know we're it's we're asking the one of the best things that lawyers can do is to ask the right questions. And so I think that's in that, in that vein, that's the right question to be asking. And in some ways, um, you know, as Kristen was saying that necessity is the mother of invention and, and Kelly has been talking a lot about all of the innovations that, that she has been seeing and moving forward. Um, you know, we're, we're experimenting in new ways. And so, you know, through, Things like you know the experience of all of us using Zoom, for example. Um, you know, initially there were issues of Zoom bombing and and things like that of sort of you know unwanted people entering in the classroom, and you know technology is kind of catching up to to make sure that we're um, safeguarding the privacy of individuals in this way. Um, it will be it will continue to be a process of innovation and iteration and. And um, you know, it's it's not a perfect system yet, but I think that we are we are getting there. And so, one of the most critical things we can do is to make sure that as we go forward, we are thinking about making sure that there is a safe space for exchange of ideas and dialogue, because it's only with that kind of space created in technology that we'll be able to answer some of the the critical challenges that are that are in front of us. Thank you so much, uh, Megan. Um... The, Christine, there is a question about, um, you know, financial aid and scholarship and access. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it, people do know, people are familiar with the fact that legal education in the U.S. is expensive. Uh, then the question is, uh, the, the, does today's crisis uh, will reimagine access to legal education uh, in a more fundamental manner? Is that, is that possible even? Um, if if access, you mean particularly from a financial aid perspective? Um, That's the question there, wasn't that? Yeah, um, I I I think it raises a, a number of, of questions um, that sort of hit all along the the spectrum of, of someone applicants um, engagement with legal education. So one of the moments where people may or may not make a decision about pursuing law school is when they see what the cost is. Um, and right, so the sort of the sticker shock moment when they think, okay, well, I want to do this. Oh, it's going to cost me what with, co with living expenses, eighty thousand dollars, ninety thousand U.S. dollars. That's completely out of my reach. Um, and so I think it behooves all of us as institutions to think about how to be as transparent as we're comfortable being, contextualizing those costs. So if you make financial aid awards based on merit or based on need, or based on a combination of those things, or if you negotiate awards in some way, if you'll listen to, you know, if you'll let someone send in an offer from another school and then look at it and see whether you can match, for example. Um, I would really urge schools to be transparent about that. We've talked a lot in this conversation about sort of equity issues in terms of access. And one of those, the, the things that's critical is just for people who are not familiar with navigating either the application process or the paying for law school process to understand what are the rules of the field on which they're playing, right? Um, so are, is there financial aid available? Is that $80,000 not real in the sense that 90% of the students get a 30% or more scholarship. And so in reality, most people are only paying something less than $90,000. Um, so 
that's not law schools are not typically extremely transparent about these kinds of things um, but I do think when people are worried about money and we're in a time when people are worried about money um, that it would be helpful for us to think about how we can offer sort of contextualizing information about affordability um, and how we can advise students to go about finding that. When someone's in law school, I do think that um, there are many, many schools that are looking at ways to be more supportive, um, right? So are there resources that we can access that are we're drawing down from federal or state um, uh, monies in order to provide resources to students? Are there things we can do institutionally? Should we be fundraising? Do we need to, if we've moved away from need-based aid, which has been a trend for some schools in the US, should we return to that? Should we fundraise for it in a more particular way? Um, so I think there'll be some considerations around that. People's situations when they started law school and when they're graduating law school may be very, very different. And then lastly, some of us have um, loan repayment assistance programs and who's eligible for them, for example, whether or not someone can, it's only people who have federal US loans, which means someone who's an international student wouldn't be able to participate, or whether that should be expanded to include some resource for someone who may be returning to another country, but planning to work in a low paying job, furthering the social, furthering social justice and public interest, which is what loan or payment assistance is for. Um, whether there's a way to think about those and to expand those so that if someone came in for an LLM, for example, you would have a combination of people who were comfortable either because they were funded by someone else or because they had their own resources of paying but if their plan was to go back and to serve underserved communities perhaps there is some way for the law school to help them manage that either with front end money or back end money um, so I, I mean I, I work in financial aid in addition to admissions and think about this a great deal there are a lot of moving parts um, law schools have an interesting kind of push-pull we have a lot of applicants and then you know, we say no to most of them. <laughs> That's the way that admissions works. Um, and then we have a certain number of admits and we, our whole job is to enroll kind of the right group of people from that much smaller pool of admitted students. And one of the only levers we have is funding. Um, obviously our institution and our programs and our reputation and our deans and our faculty are all critically important, but when someone is making a decision for, between school A and school B, often that comes down to questions of funding. Um, law schools, I, I do think, have to balance that against other institutional challenges on funding right now, um, and, and there may be lots of competing priorities, um, but most of us are or will shortly be looking at our whole suite of kind of recruitment and student support and back-end financial aid and how those things might need to be realigned in the face of this pandemic. Thank you so much, Christine. We are coming to the end of this program. I have a couple of questions. Um, Kelly and Jason, these are questions from Himanshu, Sagnik, Vibor, Gothia, Karen, uh, Saumia. It all comes down to LSAT. Uh, so there, this question is about in the US, since LSAT is an ex, a very established ex, examination, there are lots of learning opportunities. There are centers for coaching, there are textbooks, materials, uh, a well-established, a well-oiled machinery exists. Unfortunately, in the Indian context, it's given it's only a decade old and the larger imagination among coaching centers happen to be CLAT and ILET and other such exams. How does one prepare effectively for the LSAT exam in India? How does, what kind of resources that uh, LSAC can provide uh, or uh, organizations which are there, which can help the students perform in the LSAT India exam better? Great, well, I'm gonna start again and then again, ask Jason to, uh, to fill in. It's uh, such a luxury for me to have the real test development expert here on the panel with me. Um, but I do wanna say that that is a real issue. And, and I've come to understand since I've been at LSAC, how helpful uh, sometimes those organizations can be in, in giving students support and studying. But let me note that one of the things that I think will be of assistance is that while we understand that the LSAT India is specific for, L for India, there's very much a, a similarity in the question types between the LSAT in the US and the LSAT India. And there are a number of resources there, including a wonderful free resource uh, that's online. And that's the Khan Academy, K-H-A-N, 
uh, the Khan Academy is, uh, is a terrific resource for practicing LSAT questions. And then LSAC itself through Law Hub and also uh, in many other ways also has a vast amount of resources to help with preparation. And one of the things that I want to stress about the preparation before I turn this over to Jason is that I hope that all of you taking the LSAT will come to understand that this is not just a test. This is a way to start to acquire the skills that you will need in law school and that you will need as a lawyer. Those fundamental skills of, of, that Jason described of reading closely and kind of challenging the text and really looking around corners and understanding how to reason and how to apply facts to law and how to problem solve as we've all talked about today that the study for the LSAT helps you acquire those skills. And those that really is the on-ramp to your success in, uh, in legal education. So Jason, you speak about this a lot and I'm hopeful that you can uh, also offer some suggestions to prepare well for taking the LSAT India. Sure, thank you, Kelly. So the, uh, the one thing I'll start with is that um, we've, we've done studies uh, for the LSAT in the US and we know that uh, we, we ask students how they prepare uh, for the test for the LSAT. And, uh, and of course, you get a variety of responses. Uh, a lot of people do take uh, uh, prep courses and, and things like that and coaching and go to coaching schools and so on. Uh, but a lot of people do uh, just study on their own by, you know, uh, do, doing using whatever prep material uh, they can find. They don't uh, engage in any kind of formal coaching. And it turns out um, those people can do very well. Um, so the, the bottom line is, is that uh, you can uh, succeed, uh, do very well in the LSAT uh, without engaging in any kind of formal coaching, uh, which is good news, as you mentioned, because in India, there isn't uh, that large infrastructure around uh, coaching for the LSAT in India, at least as of yet. Um, so uh, the, the main thing I would, uh, I would emphasize, and I'll, I'll come back to, to Kelly's uh, recommendation in a minute, is that because it's a skills-based test and not a knowledge test, uh, really the, the thing you need to be doing is practicing those skills. And the good news is that um, more than likely you have been practicing those skills because your entire education has been building up uh, and, and hopefully been, uh, been an exercise in, uh, in te teaching you how to read critically and so on. So uh, when it comes to the LSAT India specifically preparing for that, the, the, I think the most important thing is to familiarize yourself with the test um, so that whenever you sit down on test day, you're not surprised by anything that you see. Um, because, uh, you know, as long as you're familiar and comfortable with the types of questions and so on, um, then that gives your, you an opportunity for those skills to flourish and, 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 and succeed unimpeded uh, by any other factors like, um, you know, shock. <laughs> okay. and this is, this is a, a very uh, a salient point in particular with respect to uh, the analytical reasoning questions. I remember when I first encountered this type of question myself when I took an exam similar to the LSAT uh, many years ago, uh, it, it, it really seemed like, uh, like you know, foreign math or something, not, not that it's mathematics, but it seemed very strange to me. I, I didn't understand what I was even looking at. So that's what you want to avoid on test day is being surprised by anything. So how do you prepare for the LSAT India? Well, you avail yourself of the practice tests we have available on our website uh, to, to really, uh, again, familiarize yourself and practice uh, the, the test. Now, Kelly mentioned uh, Khan Academy. And I can't stress enough how valuable a resource that is because it's free and it's online. She mentioned that the LSAT and the LSAT India are similar. I'll go further and say that they're in fact basically identical. Uh, the only difference between the LSAT and the LSAT India is that the LSAT India is easier uh, on, on the whole than the LSAT because they're testing different populations. The LSAT India is typically testing uh, students coming out of high school, whereas the LSAT is typically testing students coming out of college. So we have to make the LSAT India easier. So um, if you go on to Khan Academy and poke around and look, you're, you're, you're really going to uh, see exactly the same kinds of things that you'll see on the LSAT India. And the important thing that uh, Kelly didn't mention is that 
we LSAC provided Khan Academy with hundreds of actual LSAT questions that have been used in the past. And that's the other thing that we know too from the studies that we've done is that the single biggest factor uh, that makes a difference in performance uh, is whether you practice uh, LSAT or LSAT India questions using real LSAT or LSAT India questions. Not some questions that some coaching center made up, but real, uh, real uh, previous questions. So the Khan Academy is an excellent resource because they have the, they have the real the real thing. They have real questions, but they also have a series of articles, in depth explanations of how all the different types of questions work, videos and video explanations of worked examples of, of all these questions, and then lots of practice tests. The only thing I'll caution uh, Indian students about is that if they go to the Khan Academy and they start taking the the Khan Academy practice test, remember that those questions are going to be harder than what you'll, you'll encounter on test day. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, if, you can, if you can really push through and, uh, and, really, and really work and do well on those questions, then I think you're going to even do uh, even better on the LSAT India. So okay. that's, that's the advice I have. Thank you so much, Jason. I think what you've said about Khan Academy is so true because the, you know, one of the things that's uppermost in the minds of students is that how do they go about the process? All right, so as we end this program, I have one last question to all the panelists. It's an identical question. Uh, for all the viewers, what is your advice to aspiring law school students who are watching this, those who aspire to go to law about pursuing legal education in times of corona? For the current students of law who are watching, what would you like to tell them about possible impact in their future careers in law and justice? Let's start with Kevin. Well, let me say that I think that what we're finding is, uh, you know, here in the United States, we're facing a recession. I think the whole world is facing, you know, difficult economic times. And, um, um, you know, my sense is that some people, one way to respond to a recession is to go, go, you know, use it as a time to go pursue a professional or a graduate degree so that the economy may be difficult, but you've still got a way to move yourself forward during a very difficult time. And so that's a good, this is a good time to invest in yourself because the opportunity cost um, is lower to do that um, when there aren't, um, you know, a lot of jobs out there. So that's, so economically, this is a really good time to go to law school. If you don't do it, if you don't have a passion for it. I mean, I think that that's, uh, that's you know, that's key. You, you follow your passions. If this sounds like something that um, you want to do, like I said, if you want to change the world, if you want to help people, um, if you want to pursue justice, if you think there's already plenty of justice in the world already, then we don't need more lawyers, then, then don't go to law school. Um, but if you're passionate about those things, I think this is a great time to go to law school. So I we would welcome you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, Megan. Um, Kevin makes a great point. And I think that, um, you know, this is such an important time, as we said at the very beginning, um, where we need great lawyers helping to solve some of these challenges. But also then this is a great time to really get the skills that, that you need to succeed in the economy as we go forward. You know, we're talking, we've been talking a lot about testing. Um, and I think that all students right now, all of us have been tested in different ways, um, in, metaphorically in, in these recent times. But one of the things that I, I want students to, to realize is that to be a good lawyer, you have to be flexible. You have to have conviction and passion. You have to be able to handle pressure with grace and adapt to your client's needs, which will change over time. And, and to have kindness and, and empathy. And I guess I would also say to challenge yourself to try new things. So all of this that we're experiencing right now is also helping to prepare you in untold ways for life as a lawyer itself. Um, so I, I think draw on that strength that you are finding during this time and channel that in, in productive ways. There are law schools that have a variety of different options um, if you, um, if you're interested in, in whether it's public law, private law, health law and policy, whatever it is, you can find your passion. And now you're also able to find the format that you need wherever you're interested in, in pursuing that in the world. Um, if that's a combination of a hybrid, sort of some of it online and some of it in person, um, whatever creative solutions that you want, they're out there for you now. And there are vulnerable populations of people 
and innovations and te technology that needs to be developed. Um, and you can help fuel that. Thank you so much, Megan. That's very, very optimistic and hopeful. Thank you. Um, Christine, please. Uh, yeah, I would say simply that we're counting on you. Um, and uh, what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes it's easy to become sort of, frankly, these days, tired, exhausted, cynical, skeptical, jaded. Um, and and when I get discouraged about either the legal profession or frankly what's going on in society, one of the places that I go is, is we have a program at Berkeley Law of student initiated legal projects. So there, there's over 35 of them. They vary a little bit from year to year, but every single one of them is actually the law students saying to us, we see a problem and we think we could help address it as opposed to the institution saying you should work on these things. And so the I go and I look at the list um, because it reminds me that there are younger, smarter, faster, maybe more hopeful, uh, more creative people than I um, who are uh, out there on the cutting edge thinking about what needs to be done. Um, and I, I just went and quickly looked at the list to remind myself of all of the incredible innovation. And there's things like a digital rights project, disability rights project. There's actually now a legal automation workshop looking at how to provide, use AI and machine learning to help uh, public interest and social justice organizations to streamline their research, fill out forms for clients and have access to some of the same tools and technologies large firms do for large corporate clients. Um, these, there's problems that I didn't know were problems that our students are already thinking of solutions to for. Um, and uh, that is exactly the kind of injection of energy, of creativity, of optimism that we desperately need. Um, and so we are absolutely counting on you. And then of course we, along with LSAC, are here to support you throughout your journey. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Jason. Uh, yes, sir. I am, um, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm a testing guy, uh, and I could be uh, I could be a testing guy for any number of uh, organizations that that run tests. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm here with LSAC because I believe in the mission of uh, helping to create a more just and prosperous world. It's something that's uh, important to me as a person. So what I say to to people who are interested in law, if if that's something that you care about too, and if law is something you are uh, passionate about to go for it um, and not let all of the obstacles that are sort of looming in front of us uh, to, to sort of get in the way. Now, because I'm a testing guy, I'm also going to focus on the sort of the near term and the and the process because I sense, I sense from the questions we've gotten today and I know from my own experience that students want to know. They really, they're, they're, they're anxious and they're concerned about how do I do this? How do I do that? How's it going to work? When is I going to know this? How am I going to download this? And so on and so forth. And I understand all that anxiety and, and all the source of all these questions. So uh, what I say to the students is uh, to persevere. Um, that um, you know, it, it, testing in this sort of um, uh, situation of uh, high stakes testing is never a simple process. Never smooth and easy for everybody. Uh, but it's obviously more difficult now and. Um, it's going to require that uh, some of those uh, emotional intelligence, some of those other, you know, factors we discussed earlier, uh, for a student to sort of push through. And uh, that's not to say that we're not going to do everything we can conceivably to make it a smooth process and to share all the information that we can. Uh, but it does require a little bit of, um, of patience and perseverance on the on the part of the students as well. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, Kelly, you have the last word. Well, thank you for that. And uh, after I hear Jason, I, uh, I love having him working on the test, but I'm about ready to see if he wants to go to law school. <laughs> um, I, uh, Raj, I want to say that I think sometimes when we think about who it is that heals the world, we think too narrowly about that. Our first mind goes to doctors and they do heal the world. We also think too narrowly about who builds the world. Sometimes we first go to engineers or architects, but lawyers build the world too. And I wanna say that I think that if you want to build a better world and you wanna heal some of what has damaged our world, there's no better profession for you than to think about law because it is a beautiful and a broken world out there and law makes the difference. 
anytime you see a society that's struggling, it's because the strength of law is weak and it's struggling. And so to really make the world a place where everyone can thrive, the mo thing we most need to do is to use our training in law to bring forth healing and to bring forth a world where everybody has a chance to live, to work, to be themselves and to really thrive in all the ways that humans can flourish if we have the right infrastructure. So my last example of that Raj is that, you know, we're all looking right now for a vaccine, right? From, for COVID. But unless we have a structure in society that helps develop vaccines, that knows how to distribute them, that can have the kind of infrastructure that actually helps heal, even in something that specific, then that doesn't happen in the way it needs to. So if you wanna join all of us in building a better world, then please stay with your passion and consider law. Well, thank you so much uh, for our very distinguished uh, set of panelists, uh, uh, starting from Kevin and Megan and Christine and uh, Jason and Kelly. I also want to thank uh, the Law School Admission Council as a partner in this endeavor, particularly Anne-Mary and Yusuf and also the LSAT uh, team, LSAT India team here in India for supporting this endeavor. Uh, I want to particularly thank all of you for giving your precious time. I know we went overboard in terms of time, more than 90 minutes, but I can assure you that the viewers and all of all those questions that have come about uh, during the course of the discussion would have immensely helped them. Um, this, these sessions are being hosted by the OP Jindal Global University, Jindal Global Law School, as a part of a public interest initiative to provide uh, thought leadership in a number of areas. And in that spirit, uh, I would like to thank all of you and also to inform our viewers that we'll be back on Saturday, the 30th of May on another colloquium entitled Indian Higher Education Leaders Colloquium, the future of universities during and after COVID-19. We will be joined by Professor Dr. Virinda Chauhan, the Chairman of the National Assessment and Accreditation Council, Professor Dr. Roop Manjari Ghosh, Vice Chancellor of the Shiv Nadar University, Professor Dr. Pankaj Mittal, the Secretary General of the Association of Indian Universities, Professor Dr. Bhushan Patwardhan, Vice Chairman of the University Grants Commission, and Professor Dr. Yogesh Tyagi, Vice Chancellor of the University of Delhi. We will meet again on Saturday, 30th May. With those words, I would like to thank once again all of you for joining us and in particular thank uh, the Law School Admission Council and indeed the leadership of Kelly Testi as well as Kevin for joining us in this endeavor and partnering with OP Jindal Global University and Jindal Global Law School. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Well, your doctor says we should share, do this, you know. <laughs> Dr. Fauci has said that, you know, this is the best. That's right. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> you were a wonderful moderator, Raj. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's not, I've never done this before, so it's a two-month training. <laughs> <laughs>